Um, so go ahead and fill me in on Mr. Goose here. Where I don't even know where to start. Yeah, <laughs> where, where's the best place to start? From the beginning. Okay. So we got him when he was like seven weeks old. He flew to us. Uh, we lived in Philadelphia at the time. And he, so, he did a lot of socialization as a young puppy and didn't really have any issues. But about when he was maybe a year old, he started to get really afraid of things. So it would be random stuff. It would be, you know, a Christmas tree that somebody threw out, an open umbrella. Um, and then it sort of started to progress people, to people. People walking with canes. Right, people with canes, people with hats, skateboarders, you know, whatever. Um, we first started having like actual behavioral issues and like aggression with him in the elevators in our uh, building in Philadelphia. And so, you know, we would have to take him down the elevator and the doors would open and there might be a person there, there might be another dog there that was barking at him or whatever. Or not. Or not. It could but be someone being it didn't quiet. really matter. It got to the point where if the doors opened, he would start to react and, you know, be afraid and would would lash out and get aggressive and a couple of times you know kind of bit he bit me and he came mm. close to biting us a few different times no, okay. he also bit me during that but like i will say with that like we describe it as him like we always say like him seeing red like it's like yeah. he, he wasn't i i mean i feel like maybe people say this but like i really don't think he was trying to bite us mm -hmm. because he was mad at what was ahead and we were trying to get him away but we're pulling him closer to us because we're like we're not gonna let him go closer to the stranger that he's mm -hmm. a bite. Correct. And so he grabbed, he like got us both like in our legs. Correct. <clears throat> in so, Philly. Yeah, and so then from there, you know, we tried to see a few different train. Well, actually, I guess I should take a step back. So we had sent him to a trainer in Cincinnati when he was younger, who was just like Which is really a really poor fit. Yeah, we were the, we were in town. like we were was, like, there because it was COVID. Yeah. Okay. Um, but we just wanted basic obedience for him at that point. No, mm -hmm. we want. If he was doing the aggressive stuff. Okay. Too. Well. But the guy's like event. theory was, if you can get him to like just listen to you all the time, he'll never right. do something. He thought that basic obedience would cure the reactivity problem, mm -hmm. which it never has, right? Yeah. Um, moreover, he had been like a police dog trainer or something like that. So he used a lot of methods that were not all positive reinforcement. Mm -hmm. And it just ended terribly. Honestly, Goose was more afraid than he was going into it. Mm -hmm. He really hated that guy. Like you could tell everything, his body language was really bad. Like, so, he would do all the things, like, heal and all that stuff, and the trainer would try to give him a treat, and Goose wouldn't take the treat. Like, yeah. being really, like, weird and defiant, and, like, ah. just, you could like, just tail between scared. the legs he every single time. To. Like, every, yeah. like, you know, because they would send us videos. And the other thing that I really didn't like about it was he was in the crate all day, unless he was getting trained. Mm -hmm. But I think the trainer was saying he was having difficulty with, like, training Goose, so I feel like he was literally crated. All the time. For, and he was gone for, like, how long? Like, two, two months? So it was a board no, and train? Months wasn't two months. He was gone for okay. at least well, it was a long, it was it was a long time. time. Because then the trainer kept saying, I need more time with him. He's not, we're not getting it. So we expanded it. And so he, yes, then he was like in the crate for like all of that. So if anything, he was worse probably. Yeah, he, it was it was definitely worse. And so then after that, we worked with a behavioral veterinarian. He started taking fluoxetine to try to, you know, get it a little calmer. Mm -hmm. uh, he was he wore a muzzle for a while in Philly um, because we had to get him in and out of the out of the, the, the apartment. Yeah. Like he, yeah, we just had to. We couldn't risk having something happen. So we moved here, and things initially got quite a bit better. Just having more space, more kind of you know, he was a lot calmer. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't see nearly as many of the issues at that point, and so we stopped using the muzzle and. Uh, for the most part, he was pretty good, I think, for the first year or so that we lived here. But more recently... I mean, he always has weird, you know, weird things that spook him and stuff. Like, like he's just always been kind of weird in that sense. So, like, those didn't go away. Yeah, so, like, for example, you know, if our friends come over to our house, they see, he sees how we interact with them. Like, we give them a hug, whatever, and he treats them like friends. We have a maintenance person come over. He has to go upstairs and stay in our bedroom because he's will bark at them, lunge at them. It's frightening, you know, so he has to be put away. Correct. So it's very situational for him. Um, and recent, more recently, it started to sort of come back and he had more of these incidents. So there was a guy, you know, we have like a courtyard in where our townhouse is. Mm -hmm. And as we were walking in, there was a delivery guy there and he started freaking out and again bit me. We were in Cincinnati and he we had a guy coming to work on the house that also, I this didn't, is my mom's house, not his right, house. And I, so. But I didn't know about 
this guy coming, and so the guy shows up, and I open the door, and before I could put him away, he slipped out and was outside, and then as the guy was coming in, he nipped at this this worker and, and got him on the leg. So that was reported to the county. We went through. Were there punctures, the, or was it just like a graze? It was. A, it was more of like a scrape. It wasn't really a puncture. So but like he, he still ended up nipped being at his calf, and but he did. It did draw blood. Like yeah, okay. he got, I think the guy got hit. Yeah, okay. it was serious. I don't know if it that. was like prophylactic or what, but yeah. But in any event, that's the only person that's been not <laughs> right. Not you guys, yeah. No. So now, you know, I would say the situations that we typically see him getting triggered are one dogs, and so like when we're walking around, he will see another dog, and it's very hit or miss, and I think it is based on that dog's body language and kind of how he's feeling. But sometimes he gets very reactive, and he'll you can tell he starts to kind of like huff and puff yep. and then jump and bark and growl um, and of course we never let him go near them in that situation there's been other times where there's been dogs that you know either those owners don't respect the fact that we're trying to keep our space or what but for whatever reason he doesn't react and he gets along fine with them um, as for people it's typically i would say like at night that he's the most scared of people um, most times during the day, like we just walked over here, he doesn't, he's not reactive to people. Another example was there was a person, so Ashley was walking him, there was a dog barking in the ha in a house, and he was reacting to that dog, but there was a person coming by, and again, he like sees red, nothing happened, he didn't bite her or anything, but it was very uncomfortable because that woman was clearly scared by his well, behavior. Also because we have, so we have another dog, which also I think complicates, yeah, we, we did not bring her because puppy. she's a puppy and she's has none of those weird things, but just is a crazy puppy. Mm -hmm. So I was picking up her poop and I wasn't holding his leash very tight. He almost got out of my mm -hmm. hand and like went towards that lady. Once again, I got, I stopped it before it happened. And I also think it was triggered by the dog in the window, not by the lady as far as I can tell. But mm -hmm. that was the first time for me where like he ever did anything to like a strange, like a, a woman, like usually it's men. It's, it's almost always men. It's which never been is also weird because, as we said, we've had him since we were a pup. He was a puppy. He's never been abused. Like, <laughs> nothing like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other really main situation in which we can put on the back burner of trying to fix, because I don't know how to fix it that well with him not being here, but my mom's fiance. My mom cannot stay with us. I can't bring the dogs to Cincinnati anymore because if he walks in the door, it's the same thing as if it's like a maintenance man. Mm -hmm. He lunges, he barks. I mean, like, he hates him. He will bite him if I gave him the chance based on his, you know, based on what I can see him doing. So I would never give him the chance, of course. It doesn't help that my mom's fiance. He vaguely resembles the trainer that he really hated. Oh, okay, sure. And he first met him around the same time. I see. So they have similar characteristics, similar voices. And so I, this is just a theory that we've discussed with, you know, with a few people, but he may be associating him sure. with that trainer. I also Either way, Really my mom's fiance doesn't have dogs. He's not. Also, he, yeah. he's very bad he with like body things. language and all. Like anything you would want someone to not do he to does. approach the dog for the first time, he would do and it. He and then that. he also yeah. hates Jeff as it is. So like it's a very bad mismatch. That's something I'm not even sure if it would ever get fully fixed. But it would be nice to be able to have like my mom stay Part with of the me and visit is also me. But fixing Jeff because his behavior yeah. is never so has never I'm, been helpful. For we will yeah. ask him to do certain things or not do certain things to help mitigate the situation. He doesn't really How old is Jeff? He's in his in the 60s. He's an adult. Yeah. I, I would think he's an adult, man. Yeah. 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 Doesn't yeah, act but, like one, apparently. But, but, yeah, but he's, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is, like, if, when I say he's, like, in his 60s, it's like, I don't know if he's ever going to change. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I, I get you. I, yeah. I've, uh, I've been in this situation before. So, uh, at this point in my career, I was told, like, there's nothing... There's very, very few things that ever throw me off. Like, I'm like, okay, I've not seen that before. But, uh, yeah, I've come across that. In-laws or, you know, parents or, you know, older people. They're just like, yeah. I'm older than you. I'm going to do what I want. Kind of, that kind of thing. Uh, but he, he there's... just also has very low EQ. Uh, and so he's not very good at, like, listening when like, mm -hmm. we ask him to do things. Sure. And doesn't really, I don't think, thinks about why we're asking him to do that. Which sure. Is, his best interest and his and the dog's best interest. Yep. The last piece that I would add situationally is I'm not hundred percent sure about this, but it does seem like on average he is more reactive with, with Ashley when I'm not sure. around. Yep. And a little bit less. But it still doesn't when I'm yep. and I'll sure. also say just the other thing to point out is he tends, even with dogs here in the park, 
doesn't do that bad because I think he knows he has space. Correct. Versus like walking down the sidewalk trying to pass a dog, mm -hmm. he's gonna react more. Yes. So uh, that's just something else I've noticed and picked up with him. Like usually I can take him here, he'll look for squirrels, he'll go to the bathroom. Usually no people or dogs really tend to like crazily set him off. Mm -hmm. Versus like when we just were walking over here, in, like on our street, there was mm -hmm. a guy walking like three dogs and I can't tell you what about that group. I saw the three dogs. Yeah, 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 and he like crossed into the street. We were on the sidewalk, but Goose saw them and started that huffing and puffing yeah. and jumping and growling. So, yeah. um, so just a couple of questions. Uh, what was the date of when you got him? You said it was pre pre twenty twenty, right? Yeah, that would be twenty nineteen. He was born in March twenty nineteen. March, yeah, and we four. got him in okay. at the end of like around May. -ish. Yeah. yeah, we got him slightly okay. early Start because he had to fly. Which yeah. Okay, is so then thing we re regret. at uh so then twenty twenty happens right, which is almost like a year later. Yes. Right, and that's when you start to see these behaviors start to escalate. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, like definitely the th which like I don't think at the time we were realizing like those kind of weird fears started mm -hmm. before that, but like he wouldn't do anything other than like like truly once there was an old would have been the, the first Christmas after we got him an old Christmas tree laying on the sidewalk and it was dark out and yep. like, I couldn't get him to walk past it. Uh -huh. He wasn't like growling at it or anything he just like wouldn't do it and so i had to cross the street and go around it even sure. though it was a christmas tree sure. so like that started and then i would say weirdly enough pretty soon after he got neutered okay i started noticing it and like he was by that point he was one so it almost seemed to get worse like after that yeah the, the, the difficulty with the neutering is it wasn't like he was good before and then he was bad after it wasn't very clear but it all sort of developed around that same okay. time. Yeah. makes sense um at the earliest, uh, how old do you think he was when you started to see these things? At least oh, 10 months. Yeah. 10 months, okay, yeah. cool. So uh, a lot of this stuff makes sense to me and I'll just kind of explain everything. Uh, last thing is, are you clipped to his harness? Am I clipped to it? Yeah. This? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So and now I'll explain that too. So puppies have uh, two, in my opinion, mainly two, three pivotal uh, psychological shifts six months, a year, two years, okay? Uh, anytime a client notices a shift, it's usually around these times, okay? And it's not uncommon that it's also accompanied by a negative experience. So for example, a uh, client is with their puppy at a dog park, puppy's around six months, seven months, what have you. Uh, one of the dogs at the dog park pins the puppy down or like bites the, or like uh, is aggressive towards the puppy. Puppy freaks out, owner freaks out, oh my God, takes the puppy out. Like a light switch, the next day, puppy is not reactive. Okay. Because the situation was mishandled, uh, it has now become traumatic at a very pivotal psychological shift in that puppy's life, and it creates distrust. So most puppies trust everyone and everything, right? Um, Which is how he was when he was when we first Yeah. Him. We brought him everywhere. Right? So then what can happen is if we have the negative experience, now the puppy goes, I don't trust any dogs. And usually dogs prior to the incident are in the clear. They're in the circle of trust, as I like to call it. Any dog after, nope, not going to happen. Okay, same thing happens with people. If the if the puppy has issues with people at some point, anybody prior typically is in the clear. Anybody after, no go. Okay, so then ten months, not too far along or away from um, a year. Plus, you had the, the neuter happen at a year. Uh, plus, uh, the training, the bad training was also same time. right around a year. I think he was neutered already, so like a little after. Sure. Uh, but it already he had already started displaying the issues, right? right? So, in my opinion, there uh, we can talk about the train a little bit later. Uh, it didn't obviously help, yeah, right? right? But he was already starting to show uh, signs of what I would dub as nervousness. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know it was a Christmas tree, you know it was a Christmas tree. He does not know it was a Christmas right. tree. Right. Okay, so that's what the nervousness is from. So you ever you guys see those car? things that yeah. you know yeah, that dance yeah, around yeah, right. my dogs are freaked out by those most dogs are freaked out by those right because they're like what the hell is that it's moving erratically that is very not normal right, right? right. that's a normal response but most dogs would be nervous around it and then they're like okay that thing is gone i can settle now a nervous dog uh it'll start to happen more and more with different triggers okay so we have fear anxiety nervousness and then aggression uh, uh which would be like what i would call uh, emotional responses okay fear the dog typically wants to stay away from and they don't let it go so if i came over to uh, your house for example if he was a, a fearful dog he would be barking at me but he would not confront me that's, like what he, he, that's what he does he won't let it go okay 
a nervous dog will do the same thing, but they'll settle at some point, right, on their own. If I sit down and completely ignore the dog, they'll eventually settle. But then 15 minutes later, if I stand up, they'll start barking again. Okay? Yeah, that's nervous dog. Anxious dog. Well, I guess he, well, I should say, he does let it go. So he's more, I guess, would fall into that bucket. Nervous curve, yeah. yeah. Uh, anxious dog. No, like, sorry, just to, one time we, when we were trying to work through with Jeff, like, we had gotten him to settle before, and then when Jeff would move, he would freak out. Right, yeah. I'm saying, but you're describing the fearful dog you're saying is like, he, he doesn't never lets it go. Settle. They're yeah. never going to settle. Right? Like, yeah. he, even they with hang Jeff, on. He does settle. Like, so if you put the dog in a different room, yeah. a fearful dog, they don't stop barking. Right. Okay. He, he would, and even with Jeff in the room, like, we tried one time just to bring him on the leash and to have him sit across the room from each other just mm -hmm. to see if he would settle and he did mm -hmm. but then as soon as jeff got up he triggered yeah. yeah that's nervous dog anxious dog uh unable to relax they'll lay down get up walk to a different spot sit down get up walk to a different spot they're salivating eyes are open right that's anxious dog so they look very similar right. in the sense that since they're not confident energies they don't want to confront the problem they tend to stay away from mm -hmm. but those are uh kind of key factors that i look at that tells me is this dog more fearful is this dog more nervous is this dog more anxious and we can we're a mixture of everything yeah. okay so uh we're all animals so humans also can feel, uh, feel fear anxiety nervousness right some people are more inclined to jump into that emotion uh than others for me at this point in my life and how much stress that I've had to deal with this stuff, it takes quite a bit to get me to be anxious, right? But uh, a few years ago, I had an, uh, an ex-girlfriend, who's now an ex-girlfriend. Um, I remember calling her and asking her, could you please make a dinner reservation? I'm really booked today, but I'd like to take you out for dinner. And she's like, I'm very anxious. I'm not comfortable with that. I can't do it. And to me, I'm like, what the hell, right? Because I'm like, it's just a dinner. You're literally yeah. calling for it. But for her, it was like that daunting. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So we're all a mixture of, some of us can handle more stress, some little, and then we tend to favor certain emotions, okay? Uh, same thing happens with dogs. It's not that he cannot become fearful. It's not that he cannot become anxious. He's just more inclined to become nervous. Yeah. Does that make sense? It's like his default. Exactly. Like this, uh, okay. Default. So I look at dogs as kind of like a graph or a spectrum. They could, like, for example, I could have a dog that's very low fear, but very high level aggression. Mm -hmm. So they're still fear-based, right. but they're willing to go to a level 10 in terms of aggression. For a little bit of, uh, uh, for something that just makes them a little bit scared. I get other dogs where they're all the way up here in terms of their fear, but they will not become aggressive. They don't have the confidence to, okay? So once you start to see these things and understand it, it helps you kind of understand your dog a bit more and how he sees the world, okay? So the nervousness uh, most likely is uh, just genetics. Um, it's a part of his personality, but you didn't maybe fully see it until that one year time frame, okay? Uh, so I wouldn't say this is anything that you did wrong or anything like that. Uh, obviously, you try to address it yourselves. Yeah. Uh, but if we not also done, didn't have a chance to like choose the puppy, and so mm. it's not like we had. We didn't ever have the opportunity to like evaluate them ourselves sure. before we got him. Mm -hmm. And so, like with our other dog, she has like the inverse personality. Like she's not afraid of anything. Mm -hmm. You know, she's exuberant. Same she's breed or different breed? Same breed. Same breed. Same breeder. Um, no, different breeder. Okay. And for that one, we did obviously. We went and visited the breeder and saw the puppies. Yeah. Spent some time there. Did the breeder not out. allow you to see the dog, or they was were it? In, they were in Utah? Utah. Utah. So I see. Because right. like, yeah. that's also the flying part. Yeah. yeah. Is also another thing. Yeah. Okay. It's so like I had another client uh, that they also had the dog flown in from a different place. Uh, dog had issues. Um, I don't remember exactly what they were, but I remember thinking like I'm pretty sure the flight freaked the dog out. Yeah. You know because. Um, I know commercial airline stuff, like there's a lot of horror stories about dogs flying via commercial stuff. Um, so potentially something happened there, maybe. But I would say you probably would have seen it yeah. sooner. Um, and there's sometimes stuff that people see, but they don't recognize it as like, oh, this is a thing that we should probably address. Yeah. You know? So I can tell you, like, there weren't any issues that I was aware of on the journey itself. Mm -hmm. However, the first few days that he was home, he like would not sleep he would <clears throat> cry bloody murder at night he like he was totally fine when he was with me mm -hmm. and that, you know out of his prey they were like on his own mm -hmm. but at night when i put him in that crate to try to go to sleep it was impossible and that lasted for how long probably six months I mean, before he, he would like it so i don't know but it was probably sure. six six months maybe not full six months but it was a good amount of time until he would go to sleep in the crate without crying like crazy mm -hmm. and later on almost a year you know after when he was a year and change old we, we put him back in the crate 
at certain points as part of well, the trainer told us to show. the training mm -hmm. and he would sit in there and pant yeah. and slobber all over the place yeah. and it was like I mean like insane. he soaked like the bed oh, through yeah. with slobber so yeah. then I asked and another trainer that was, would be anxiety like, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so um so technically the behavior started then okay um typically it's not it's 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 uh, not uncommon for a puppy to have issues with the kennel okay reason being uh, especially a puppy from a breeder, for the first two months of their life, they're with an, another being all the right. time. Other puppies or the mom, right? And then we pluck them from that and we go, here you go. We ship them, we fly them, right. you get them. You do all the cooing and coddling that most people would do. Right. Uh, your puppy's probably doing little puppy things like nipping and barking and all that stuff. That doesn't become, or is not a corrected in my book, we correct that. Right. Uh, but then also the kennel thing, because now the puppy is forced to be alone. It's having to learn how to be independent. Right. is it typically takes around two weeks, maybe a month for a puppy. And it, I always talk about it, you should start to get a decline. Okay. If it's static and or increases, then we have a problem. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the fact that it went on for six months already tells me that's like, this is genetics to me. Right. Yeah. It but was, it didn't become. It was a slow, slow decline. Yes. And we were like doing, we had, you know, the snuggle puppy and like we, we did try to ease it for him but yeah it was not like yeah. a two week adjustment process which I remember because of, you know I read a, a few books about it and they kind of said like there's always the first night you're always going to kind of run into that challenge mm -hmm. right but they should get acclimated to that fairly quickly as they start to feel safe in that place and for a lot of puppies they actually start to identify it as a safe place for them mm -hmm. that never happened correct right so the other way we look at it is from the human component, because you want to soothe your puppy, you know, it's a, it does. It makes us feel bad to think our puppy's under stress, right? Is we do, uh, we, we try to console the puppy, but actually that reinforces the weakness. There is a YouTube video. It's a great video. I think it's a golden retriever or, or a lab retriever mother. Um, there's a litter of puppies playing, and then there's one puppy that's by itself. Okay, that's the antisocial puppy. That's the puppy with issues. So people, the side note, when they go and they see that puppy, they usually pick it because they go, oh, that's the quiet puppy. And I go, no, you want the fucking annoying puppy. Right. <laughs> that's right. a normal dog. Yeah, which yeah. is like our other our other dog is, that's, she's the annoying puppy. Yes, yeah. right, that's that's stability. So what she does is she takes the antisocial puppy, she picks it up and it's screaming and she plops it with the other puppies and you see it run out. She picks it up and she plops it, and she keeps doing that, right? And eventually the puppy keeps escaping, so then she goes and she starts nipping and prodding the puppy and the puppy submits and it rolls on its back and it was crying and it's whimpering and then she walks away because the, the puppy finally stayed within the social context right so right there she didn't have mercy so to speak she's like you need to learn how to be tough right. because you have to support yourself this is what's best for she you. doesn't yeah. understand that he's gonna or she's gonna be adopted out at some point right but we tend to meet the weakness with love and affection whereas in the animal world they meet it with discipline we're not Toughness, gonna accept right. exactly okay so that's why earlier I said we would correct that stuff if yeah. I had the puppy. And right. that's why I'm able to raise, you know, we get unstable puppies at my facility from time to time. And then we treat them like other dogs would. We discipline them, all that stuff. And then we're able to build their confidence. Right. And more often than not, as long as the clients are working with us, we can bring that puppy back to stability. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, when it comes to the genetic parts, again, uh, parts, uh, don't, don't worry about it. Uh, you, you did what everybody does. Um, you have... You happen to have just a nervous dog. Yep. Okay. Now, um, when it comes to the approach and stuff, because you mentioned with the other trainer, he was not all positive reinforcement, right? Neither am I. Uh, I'm assuming before you guys reached out, you did research right up on how we train and the methods that we use. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, we're, we're generally familiar with a bunch of different methods and styles. Okay. And so, yeah. We're... So, I'm going to explain uh, what we use and why we use it and how it applies to your dog. Okay. okay. So, uh, I uh, primarily train with remote call. E-collar. Okay. Did your trainer? What, what tools did he use? So he did no, not use an e-collar. He had a prong collar. Okay. Um, now the other thing is, so he, when we board them, he goes to a hunting dog trainer in Northern Indiana, mm -hmm. who is actually trained in behavioral, in a dog behavioral training. So he doesn't just do hunting dog training, mm -hmm. but like he routinely works on these kinds of issues. And he's actually the way that he's described his issues is very much in line with what you've said, mm -hmm. and especially that response around we react with like 
too much compassion, right? Mm-hmm. Instead, we need to instill independence and correct. Right, and, yeah. and confidence. I like a trainer already. Right. <laughs> and com- confidence is the word that he always uses. Yeah. yeah. Like this doc needs to learn how to be independent and be confident when they're independent, and then you won't see any of those issues. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And one theory that I have, which I don't know if it's true or not, is when when he works with him, it's um, I think it also helps because they're agitated when they're in the field, they see birds, right? Mm-hmm. And so they're in a high emotional state, mm-hmm. even though they're not necessarily afraid. And they, he's learned to build a little bit more control when he's in like a very excited state. Correct. Um, but he also does use the e-collars when they're training mm-hmm. and has used it with him before. Okay, yeah. excellent. But the Cincinnati trainer mostly just uses His was just prong collar, collar, but like yeah. instead of saying just like no, or doing like only giving him when he did the right thing, he would give him like a pop. Yep. Yep, yep, okay. So that, yeah. So uh, the reason why I don't do prong as much anymore is one, it takes a lot of technical skill on uh, part of the handler. Uh, it's harder to teach to the average dog owner, okay? Two, if I have a dog that already has trust issues, if I take that prong collar and I correct him, right, I have now created um, a relationship with the dog. So if the dog is nervous of me and I correct them for being nervous of me, do you see that? Yeah. Like I'm saying like, this is why you should be nervous of me because right. I physically corrected him. Right. Now, if you correct your dog with a prong collar, it's a bit different because you have a personal relationship with them. He trusts you, right. right? But now the problem is you correct them. And even if you correct them correctly, he looks at you and goes, dad, why are you correcting me for being nervous of this right. guy, right? Because he doesn't understand that I mean no harm. He doesn't right. understand that you've paid for my time and you've scheduled it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's why I also don't really do prong as much anymore because you have to see the world the way your dog sees the world. Right. Okay. So because I understand that, that's where e-collar is such a valuable tool because it's a neutral. The dog does not know where it's coming from. Right. You may be pressing the There's button. Not a, not exactly. Like connection. I might be pressing the button, but the dog does not know where it's coming from. He just from. only knows there's a stimulus. There. Exactly. Yeah. He thinks it's the dog got going. Don't do that. And okay? is it, in their view, is it easier for them to connect the dots then when it's not, like he can't ascribe, because he can't ascribe that to me or you directly, mm-hmm. because he can't see it, is it easier for them, him to then connect that with a behavior or a situation because yes. yes. he's not confused about why Correct. it's okay. coming from one of us? So here's an example. If I get a dog that's scared of me, okay, so I actually have a case right now, it's a nervous case as well. Uh, it's a pit bull, her name's Indica. Um, she was growling at me, barking at me and all that stuff, barking at people, barking at dogs and the, the lady was walking her and everything. Um, the first two classes, we covered all the reactivity towards dogs. That was the first thing to go, okay? But every time she would see me, she would still growl, okay? And I told the owner, the reason why she's still growling at me is because she still perceives me as, as a threat because we don't have a personal connection. Sure. Okay? So what do you think I had to do to get the dog to not be nervous of me anymore? Like Build a connection? Stuff. You're very close. How would I connect with that dog? Like praise play with her? Not play. Uh, Walker. Not praise. I'm not sure. Very good, good, good guesses. I have to touch her. Okay. Right? Because if my presence mm-hmm. alone is making the dog right. uncomfortable, yeah. she has to have the extreme. The extreme is simply the touch. Mm-hmm. Right? So we did that on the third class. I said, okay, after today, now your dog goes, all right, this whole time I've been perceiving you as a threat, but you actually touched me. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Right. But what happened then was because I touched her and she then feared for her life, because remember, she's perceiving threat the e-collar because at that point it had been conditioned when it turned on when she flipped out it settled her and I was still touching her and she was not being hurt but the collar was not turning on anymore right and we kept repeating that where I'd walk away I'd come back I'd touch the dog again right and and she would growl because she's going I'm uncomfortable with this growling doesn't mean aggression growling is communication and we kept repeating exactly I don't I'm not comfortable with this which makes sense because no one had touched her other than her owner right so now when she sees me she's indifferent to me because I, I broke the barrier. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. So here, you know, and every case is different. So when we do remote collar, uh, the reason why it's such a valuable tool to me, one is that the dog does not understand where it's coming from. They can more easily tie it to their behavior. So when we do the repetitions, initially the dog might perceive it tied to me because like, hey, you touched me and the bad thing happened. Yeah. But when we keep repeating, the dog goes, you know what? You keep touching me, now the bad thing's happen. not happening. Right. They're not connected. I'm not going after you. You're not scared of me. You're not running away. It's a psychological thing, yeah. right? So we keep repeating that and the dog goes, oh, so if I do this, the thing turns on. If I don't do that, it doesn't turn on and you're not harming me. Right. That's how we start to kind of get the dog to perceive things exactly more, differently. More, more they have to, 
Yes. So there's different types of confidence, right? So there's there's a sports dog confidence, hunting confidence, but then there's life confidence. Right. Does there's that make plenty sense? of hunting confidence. But Correct. Not and they don't unfortunately confidence. overlap. Yeah, they don't. Which you is, know, which is. Uh, always been a little bit of a mystery no, to me. No, because our other dog has probably like little hunting confidence. Yeah, and, th- and that's sky. actually what the what their, she, their boarding well, trainer has she's said. She's not afraid of anything. I mean, so far. He, and he's pointed this out. He's like, and when they go into the field, Goose performs great and he's super confident and he mm-hmm. gets the instructions yep. and all this and you know, he's got his head up and he's scenting right yep. and doing a great job. But like, as you know, obviously we struggles know with life. Right? Struggles with life. Yeah. Whereas Gertie, our other dog, she has so much confidence out here, you know, and is totally fine. But he was actually saying she doesn't have that much hunting confidence. Yeah. Yet. And, yeah. and so isn't that interesting? She needs to continue how it's to not that. concrete, right? right? You get all these fluctuations. Um, so my specialty is the life confidence. Yeah. Well, that's okay. what we need. That's, that's what we need. Yeah. 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 The hunting stuff. So I can help you there. The hunting stuff is great. <laughs> I don't like hunt, a, so I don't even care. <laughs> I, I, look, I view it as like a nice pastime for him. He was bred for yeah. that. It's, he loves it. I right? love that you're doing great. that because you're meeting what he's born to do. Right. And I want to give him like an outlet where he can be productive and happy that's not yes because people sometimes they get these breeds because they like the way they look yeah and you know there's breeders that breed for show right the way they look and there's breeders that breed for the work right and sometimes people are impatient and they just get the dog that works because they want the look but then they're mad because now the dog has issues because those needs aren't being met so kudos to you for doing that yeah okay and i do hunt they're not i mean look they're not amazing or anything but hey i take them up to the field yeah it's fun for sure so here, with your particular case, um, the way I would approach it is it's remote color, okay? The one that we use has 127 varying levels of stimulation. So uh, do you use a remote color then? Not in the field. I mean, we, we have, have one, one, but part of the reason why I never really got to that point was because we started running into everyday life issues. Sure. And I was like, I'm not confident enough in myself and I would like to solve the life issues before I start trying to work with him in the field. Yep, yep. Because it's just more important to us, right? Sure. Like, oh, yeah. You know, I mean, just, just doesn't life is, is obviously 100% yeah, exactly. of what you're doing with him. Like, so. That just doesn't nearly matter as much to us. Chris, if you remember, we about. actually did use one in Philly. It was your hunting one, but we used it because we had done all the obedience stuff, and he, he knows it all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he knows it is obedience. But if there's things like well, squirrels too. or any of those things out here, and you're telling him he all... Yeah. He's not going to do it. Um, and I feel like we used it, but the thing that was so interesting about it, which maybe just means he needs more bolted or whatever it is, we would do it. And like, if he, he wanted something, yeah. he, it, but this, let's this pause color because wasn't. he wasn't really conditioned at that point. Sure. Right? Yeah. And which that is was a big the factor. other reason why we, we put it aside was because we're like, I, I knew he needed to be properly conditioned for the tool before it could actually be employed. Mm-hmm. And at the time, I was like, I'm not confident in myself enough to, to do that. So I don't want to do it wrong. Sure. Right. Because then I felt like the we just had issues. to do like a million now, hits of it and like. The other trainer that he, the board and train that he's gone to, he's conditioned him, but in the field context, I don't know. Yeah, that's it's different. Context, yeah, correct. Right? That's a lot different. So, and also like he may be using a different uh, collar than we do. Yeah. And I'll explain all that stuff. So, um, our, our the remote collars that we use are they're they're, they're meant for hunting. Uh, most hunting collars have around 10 to 20 ish levels. Uh, think of 127 on our collar as like 20 on like one of those collars, except we have 107 more divisions. We can really fine tune it, which yeah. is super important, okay? And if it's good enough for life, it's good enough for sport. Well, that's for sure. Okay? Yeah. So um, the first thing that, we're, that I always cover um, is heel, okay? Because uh, for a number of reasons, one, leash pulling and leash reactivity are like the two most common problems that dog owners have, yeah. okay? So right away, class one, we're gonna use the command or teach the command, the behavior that's gonna address those things, okay? Two, most people in the city of Chicago walk their dogs three times a day, seven days a week. So that's three times a day, seven days a week, you're practicing this exercise. Now we have a ritual, okay? Because your dog is a nervous dog, okay? Uh, Or primarily nervous, e-collar is a stressor. Nervousness is a stress response, okay? If I need this dog to override the environment, override the people of the dogs that he views as threats and the squirrels and stuff, our power might be up there, okay? So technically what we're doing is we're overriding one stressor with another stressor. Does that make sense? Because we're doing that, we're probably gonna see an influx in a nervousness or anxiety. It's normal, okay? 
Uh, but you'll start to see that over time, he's gonna start becoming anxious or nervous less and less and less, okay? Because you're exposing him to the stressor in a controlled context. He is learning if he does certain things, it turns on. He learns if he stops doing those certain things, it turns off. So now he starts to think, wait a minute, I actually control this to a degree. Does that make sense? Exactly. So what we do is we condition the heel first. Uh, I don't really target the reactivity. Like I don't say we're gonna do heel and reactivity because it's a lot of information. But a lot of times what happens is after we've covered the heel, reactivity drops, okay? Because when the dog goes out into the world uh, and they're already under a state of stress, he's already at a four. And then you add a thing that he doesn't like, now he's jumping to six to seven very quickly. But when you start to teach a dog how to heal and focus, in order to focus, they have to calm down, okay? So now he's going out into the world at a one or two, he's no longer in an escalated state. Right. And now it takes more for him to get to that 10. Does that make sense? It does. And we've tried to do like a mini version of that, I guess, just by, especially when we're entering and exiting our little condo area mm -hmm. in the courtyard, we always try to make him heal for sure when we're going in there because having him focus on us does seem to help him mm -hmm. avoid some of the other things. Mm -hmm. It's probably not to the same level as what you're describing. Correct. So when we heal with the dog, I don't care what the environment is. I don't care if you're in a hallway. I don't care if you're in a busy, you know, a Chicago park or what have you. You have a completely slack leash. Uh, your dog is walking with you step by step. So if you take five steps, he takes five steps. You take two steps, he takes two steps. When you stop, he automatically sits. Yep. I don't care what's going on, okay? When you have that level of attention and focus, uh, it really builds the dog's confidence because now he's thinking, all right, I really have to focus on you because if I don't, 70 happens, right? So then he's going, he's doing that math. He's like, oh, there's that dog I don't like. But if I blow up, I know this will happen and I don't want the consequence. So I'm not gonna do anything and see what happens dog passes, nothing happens here, and he goes, oh, well, that dog didn't cause me any harm. Nothing happened with the collar. I guess I can just relax and do nothing. Right. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. So It gives him an alternative. Correct. Here, Unfortunately, we cannot communicate with him. Like, hey, bud, you don't want to do these things. Like, it's not nice. It puts I'm us under. That'd be, that'd be great if we yeah. could. But. You know? but, uh, so dogs are physical creatures. They nip and bite each other. Uh, you guys have obviously experienced that yourself. Yeah. Uh, that would be what we call redirected aggression. You're correct, he's not intending to hurt you, but he's frustrated because he can't get to the target. You're trying to redirect him and you're pulling him towards you and eventually that frustration is gonna go somewhere and you're the closest thing, yeah. okay? Most dogs go for the leash. It's good to know that he goes for the handler because that's something that I would have to work with you with on how to work around that because um, if we get a dog that redirects, uh, because that's also a stress response. And remember, e collar is a stressor. I'm gonna go, I expect that to happen, so I have to teach the skills of, it may happen, we have to push through it, but this is how you avoid getting bit, Sure. okay? So, first two classes are always on heel. Heel's a two-part exercise. We cover part one. I don't touch your dog. You show up with your dog and your tool, and I like to train here, as long as the weather permits, because, and this isn't even busy. Yeah, I know, yeah. Uh, yeah you guys, so we, we live really close to here. Perfect, uh, okay. So. Actually, when we first moved here, we used to bring him quite a bit, and he would go run and play with the other dogs that are often here, mm -hmm. and really didn't have too many issues, but um, but yeah, we're used to this environment. Yeah, yeah. So this is great because one, it's very realistic for you, but then, you know, when I get clients from like all over the city, I'm like, this is the busiest park in Chicago, yep. okay? I know this for a fact because one of my clients was a judge. Her daughter was a, uh, when she did studies of all the Chicago parks to see how much they were being used. She said this is the busiest the park in Chicago, okay? So we're right here in the middle of it. And I tell everybody, if you can make it happen here, everywhere else should be easy peasy, okay? So uh, you show up with your dog, I coach you through everything. It's all hands on for you. If he became reactive, I walk you through it real time, okay? okay? Uh, that's, that's, I think, a big part for us is, because in the past, the people we've worked with and, and tried to train with have not been there in real time. Sure. And so that was a critical part for us oh, because we're kind of going back into this with him and really committed to trying to work through it mm -hmm. was that we work with somebody who is able to see it in real time and in our real life. Yeah. yeah. So. so I coach you through all that. Okay. Uh, so then I send you off with your homework, rinse and repeat, come back uh, a week later. Okay. You give me feedback. Did his reactivity drop? Is it the same? Is it, you know, 50% better? Blah, 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 right? What are the moments or the context of? And that tells me what I need to do next, okay? Do we have to play with the level a little bit? Sometimes I get it where people come around, come back and like, Jesse, no reactivity this week. Like it's a complete just 180. Not all clients are like that, although it is nice when I get those. Uh, there is one drawback to that though, 
is that if your dog makes that quick of a 180, you don't get the experience of working through the problem, okay? So then, but I still give you the insight just in case because it's very good to know. Uh, so then the second class, you give me feedback, I make some adjustments. Uh, we work in the second half of heel. Uh, we will recover, we will cover reactivity if it's still showing its head. And I'll walk you through, this is what you want to do so you have instruction, even if we don't see it. And then you go off, rinse and repeat, okay? Between classes two and three, what I'd most likely have you do is give me feedback within a couple of days, okay? If you come across reactivity and you're like, Jesse, we were able to control it and, and, and shut it down with the instruction you gave us, we feel very confident, I go, great, come back for class three, let's work on recall or something, whatever next, sure. okay? If it's like we're having a tough time, then I might suggest we meet at my facility where I can bring in a dog and we can do controlled contacts and I can walk you through it real time, okay? So that's me bringing in a dog that would ideally piss him off come in close to you, set them off, and right. then walk you through set it. Set the situation. Exactly, yeah. okay? And then uh, at that point, I'd probably say, take a week or two to practice, uh, make sure that what's we, what we did or covered is working, and then you would give me feedback in that time frame so I don't just disappear for two weeks. Because uh, if it's like, hey, Jesse, we did everything we did at the facility, it's not working, I go try this instead. And I do it by email, yeah. okay? Because once you understand it, it's very simple. You're just changing the level, essentially, yeah. okay? Everybody has a breaking point, so the answer is almost always raise it up. Okay, once we got it, uh, so uh, I have a dog who actually uh, last week, we did this with them, I saw them on Tuesday and it said take the next two weeks because they were struggling with reactivity, but I already knew the owner was uncomfortable with going higher. So then I saw him, you're gonna start at 80 from the get go, you're not gonna raise it from 30 to 80 because that's why your dog is reactive. You're taking too much time to get to the point where the dog respects. I was like, if you just start at the number the dog respects, we're gonna shut down the reactivity immediately. Sure enough, within a couple of days, like, hey, what you said worked. Okay? But I'm still telling them to take two more weeks because I want to make sure it's sinking in. Okay, Because sometimes we can get like um, it, it, the first few days, hey, it's working really great. And all of a sudden, it just flips. And then it goes south. Then I tell the owner, it's okay, it's normal, like raise it up again. Okay. So one question, like, do you ever find that the dog would get collar-wise? Nope. Oh, yes. Yes, collar-wise, yes. Okay, but I don't get, I don't ever, I haven't ever had a dog where the collar stops working. Yeah. Okay, so collar-wise, the uh, best way to explain that is, do you guys drive? Yes. Do you go on the expressway? Yes. Do you go the speed limit? Well, close enough. I'm gonna say I never go the speed limit on like drive, so I don't work, so. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, five, 10 over. So you guys are like cop-wise. Yeah. Does that make sense? Cop-wise, yeah. Yes, yes. So think of the e-collar as a cop on a collar. When it's present, uh, your dog will behave better. Okay, just like humans drive better. Right, on the an expressway, Lakeshore Drive, obviously most people speed. Right. And then when you get behind someone who is going the speed limit, you're like, oh, yeah, and you get around them, right? So, but then you see a squad car, we slow down, we pass the squad car, we're in the clear, we speed up, right? That's what we call opportunistic behavior, okay? Uh, it's nothing good or bad, it's the way of the world. It's just how it is. Uh, your dog is the same way. It's, it's an instinctual behavior. So in the wild, if there's like a pond of fresh water, and uh, what is the fresh water? Is it an alligator? Like let's say there's sure. one yeah. right in the water and the animals know they don't drink water. The alligator leaves, they drink water. Alligator comes back, they leave the water. Right. Does that make sense? Opportunistic behavior. So same thing for your dog. When the training is done correctly, the application of your collar should always dip. Okay, should always come down. In the beginning, it's gonna be a lot, but then as he starts to get his nervousness in check, we get the reactivity in check, obedience is becoming more reliable, all that stuff. Uh, at the, the need to press the button should become less, yeah. okay? Uh, if it's staying static and or increasing, that tells me you're not doing the homework correctly. And it's almost always driven by the owner is too low because they feel bad going higher on the collar, okay? Um, otherwise, when clients are doing the homework, the collar is simply present because the dog goes, okay, the cop is here. Right. And I know I can't misbehave. Uh, in my book, it's when you need it, you have it. If you're gonna be at the park, you should be off leash, you need it. If you're walking through you know, Chicago and all that stuff, enjoying the day with your dog, you need it. Friends coming over, maybe you need it, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jeff coming over, you need it, right? Yeah, Otherwise, if he's a great dog in every other context, you don't need it, right. you take the collar off. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, and I mean, I was just curious because I've heard about that in the hunting context where yeah, yeah. guys will try to train their dog with the collar, but then will try to continue to like the behavior without it. And they're like, oh, the dog's just collar wise, and mm -hmm. so they don't have the same. For me, other, like, yeah, yeah. Speaking of opportunistic behavior, they're like, I'm going to take the opportunity and now run away and go chase that squirrel. Yeah. Rather than go, you know, I think it's very funny, just because, um, you know, especially if you're a trainer, 
where like the you know I feel like they're trying to sell the, the client a dream of like yeah you're gonna get your dog off the collar I go but why what happens so the most common thing that we get when dogs run away is the random firework out of nowhere yeah okay a lot of dogs are scared of fireworks so if I'm at the park and this actually happened to me with a client in the West Loop we were training this was like 2018 2019 uh, we were doing long leash stuff and somebody blew up a firework and I remember seeing it go up into the air and there was dogs playing off leash and I was like, who's gonna run away? The the firework blew up, the dog scattered, no one ran away, thankfully. His dog tried to run, he tapped the collar, dog ran right back to him. And I was like, this is why we train outside, because you just got caught off guard, but now you essentially stopped and corrected the behavior. But you also just learned, if your dog did take off on you because he got spooked of something, the collar's gonna override the situation and bring the dog back. Yeah, and like, I mean, look, we're, full transparency, like, I don't care if he wears a collar for the rest of his life. Like, we're at the point where it's like, we, just need to get this under control and managed because it frankly can be really stressful for us oh, yeah. right and especially if i'm not around yeah, you know I ashley does not feel like she has yeah well i think she he's strong and yeah and i, feel, I don't feel like i don't feel, feel like safe she has if control. he's gonna do something like he could literally pull out of my hands and me like yeah it and, happens to be honest with you yeah you know so um, you're not the first, you're not gonna be the last, okay? This is what I've built my career on. I specialize in fear, nervousness, aggression, anxiety, all that stuff. Uh, the main thing that always holds us back is simply the owner. They're not willing to go where they need to go for the dog, okay? But I will walk you through that. Everything that we do makes makes sense, okay? We don't come in hot. I don't come in going, hey, let's go to 100. Right. We start low, we work our way up. I don't decide the number, your dog does, right. well, okay? Him, yeah. So if we're working and uh, I end up at 80 and then I'm getting what I want at 80, then the answer is 80. If we start at 18 and we're getting what we want at 18, then the answer is 18, right? So like I had a case, and um, did you guys watch any of our like training videos? I might have. Okay, okay. I suggest you do, and I'll let you know afterwards. But there's one particular case uh, that I posted up on our Instagram. One of the worst reactivity cases I've had in 12 years with a 20 pound dog, <laughs> yeah. okay? The dog was reactive here from dogs all the way in that lot over there where they play off leash, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay? The entire, the entire, I wish I recorded the consultation because I'm like, oh, 20 pound dog thing, this gonna be easy. I was like, wow, I should have recorded this. Right. This dog was terrible. Um, so because I recognized the intensity of the reactivity, I told the owner, you want the collar that's meant for a Rottweiler, okay? It's the highest powered collar there is. And I said, I know your dog is small, but trust me, when your dog is in that, in that mental state, the red zones, if you will, exactly, zone, yeah. we need enough power to cut through. So she listened, she followed my instructions. Uh, it actually took me up until the fifth class to finally resolve the reactivity. But we ended up having to walk around the park, uh, go to 127 and tap the dog at 127 every single time, okay? And I told her, take two weeks. She came back two weeks later, we were training right there. A dog was walking by and you see it in the little video that I posted up, you see her when she's being reactive and then she looks at the dog completely does not care, okay? But the owner followed my every instruction. She just believed, okay, Jesse, you know, but it doesn't make sense logically because you're like, Jesse, it's a fucking funny dog. Right, yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, I understand that. No, but, but that yeah. the quote, it's not about the size of the dog and the fight, but the fight and the right. dog. I was like, that quote is like 100% right, okay? So, but because she followed the instructions, we stopped the reactivity and she went up to class nine or 10 and now she's working on building her dog's off leash reliability because we squashed the reactivity. So now she can get the bonus stuff that right. she wanted, okay? So as long as you, you know, trust in me and follow the instructions, we can get it done. Now there's some things that I like to be transparent about and that is you have a nervous dog. I cannot make your dog unnervous, right. but I can help your dog handle the nervousness better and I can help you learn how to live and handle a nervous dog. We're on board with that. I mean, okay. I think at this point we've sort of realized like it's innate. It's not. It's part of who he is. It's never going to go away. Correct. Completely. Correct. But what we can do is try to learn how to help him manage it better yes. and think through it better on his own. Yes. And more importantly, for us to learn how to manage it. Better Correct. Yes. On our own. Because part of our problem and part of why we have been so stressed, is we don't feel like we've got. We have the tools. Correct. Ourselves to manage it. Correct. So yeah. So I help you with all that stuff. Uh, help you like I enter like I already understand nervous dogs so that's why earlier I explained it right so I help you start to be able to predict things in certain situations where you're like hey like he looks like he's gonna get nervous you can kind of uh, see ahead if you will okay um, the reactivity stuff I'm not worried about uh, people coming over uh, partially territorial behavior uh, also his nervousness is kicking in and he's having a hard time coming back to stability okay we also can work on that okay that would require an in-home session uh, and then I show you an exercise of how we uh, communicate with a dog that he doesn't need to be territorial. Uh, if 
trying to build a relationship between him and Jeff is something that's on your menu, right? Uh, I can help you with that. The one thing that's going to hold us back is, of course, Jeff's behavior. That's okay. Well, the, and also he doesn't live here. That's, that's the thing that that's worries the me the like, most, though. It's is, not. We haven't ever been able to do a lot with it because it is infrequent. Mm -hmm. Like he lives in Cincinnati, where my mom lives. Mm -hmm. We live here, and now to the point, if they're like they're coming in town this coming weekend, they're getting a hotel because I'm just like I can't. It's too stressful for me. Yeah. It's dangerous, and I just won't deal with it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so let, the other issue in. will be getting. Let me ask a different question, mm -hmm. though. Like, if if he if we're able to work on through his his reactivity and kind of progress him to a state where you know he's he's doing better, what are the odds that that will take some of the edge off of his relationship with Jeff? Quite a bit. Without doing dedicated. Work? Not not if Jeff was like me, like right, I'm indifferent to him right now. Sure. Right. If Jeff was like this, I would say very easy. The fact that he's not taking instruction, uh, which. Um, uh, in my book, because earlier you said like when we ask him not to do things, I, I always think if I don't ask, I tell. Right. Well, we do tell. But he doesn't listen. Yeah. yeah. So unfortunately, that's where the barrier is, right? Yeah. What we can get is coexistence. So one, uh, the mental state, we can control that. We can shut that down, right? Uh, we also have place command. Are you guys familiar with place yeah. command, right? Yeah, uh, kind of knew it for a little bit. Okay. <laughs> we when we do, done it in some time. when we do place, it's go there and you don't you don't get off until I give you permission, right? Uh, that paired with like, for example, your muzzle, which, you know, kudos to you for having been using that tool, that takes off a lot of liability, okay? And I can tell you like, this is how you can get the two to coexist. The main problem is, let's say he's on place, he's minding his business, maybe he's even got the muzzle on, which I would recommend. And Jeff's like, wow, he's being so good, right? Let me go say hi to him and see how this turns out. And then now that creates this trust because now Jeff is pushing into his boundaries. Right. He's doing what he's supposed to do. Exactly. Right. And he, now he's confined because he's going, guys, I can't get off of here because I will be corrected. And this guy is it's putting. Like forcing his hand. Yeah, yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. So now we have to see again his world. I right? mean, we, we, if, we, if there's any chance in hell that we have with Jeff, it, it's to at least get him to be indifferent. And, and I think if we can build enough confidence in Jeff that Goose won't be reactive as long as he's indifferent, that would be like a good starting point. Mm -hmm. But I think that's probably like number three on our list. Yeah, that's of like, because like, like I said, it's infrequent enough that, I mean, like we can yeah. avoid it. I mean, the only thing that would be I nice would be like if my mom yeah. could ever come stay with me. Yeah, yeah. That, to me, that's doable. Brings, well, her, your mom can come stay. That's yes, no. Mom. But normally well, she brings him. Yeah. But I think what the way we're looking at it is like, let's deal with the problem in front of us, which is our daily, or his daily existence and nervousness and issues that mm -hmm. he has in our daily lives. And then if we're able to make progress on that, that then we can look at the time. Sure, yeah. So I'll, I'll give you some options and then you pick and choose. Okay, so my, my ceiling is always up here because of the tool that we're using. Okay, if we're doing prong collar, it's like all the way down here. If we're doing food, it's like all the way down here. Like you're not getting anywhere. Okay, with remote collar, it's the greatest tool because we can override the dog. Uh, I've had some cases that were so aggressive, uh, like Rottweiler, 150, 130 pound dogs, they needed two collars in order for us to cut through the aggression. But as long as the owner was like, whatever I need to do, Jesse, I trust it. I go, great, everybody's got a breaking point. Dogs bite each other. This is a dog bite, it's 10 stitches, okay? So we're communicating with, on them, uh, with them with, on their level, and that's why it's effective. I'm not coming in trying to make your dog squeal like again he's picking everything but if it's like yeah he's overriding the situation like all right let's just get another collar like it's gonna stop sooner or later okay so and it's very rare obviously it's like a handful of cases in 12 years that i've had to do that yeah um i would put you at around nine to 12 classes okay uh with nine we have two the first two on heel a third one would be a variable if we're still struggling with reactivity we would, we would cover reactivity we have to squash reactivity in order to do everything else okay um, so then at that point, if uh, we do that third one reactivity, you'll take a couple of weeks uh, to go rinse and repeat, everything going well, we come back for class four, okay? Class four, I like to cover recall. I know we have behavioral stuff, but I like to try to cover recall uh, because it takes the longest to teach, yep. right? And reliable recall out gives you just much more freedom with your dog, yeah. okay? Uh, class five um, could be uh, uh, me coming over. Uh, how do we handle guests coming into the home? How do we shut our dog's territorial behavior down, okay? You could also, Switch that with recall. You guys pick and choose. Um, I just show up. Uh, so we had two on heel, a third, the third one maybe on reactivity, recall, uh, people coming over. The sixth one, uh, most likely do uh, stationary control, like place command, like really, like you're gonna go there, you're not gonna move for two to three hours, sure. okay? The seventh one, uh, we could do, how do we correctly introduce our dog to new people he's not very familiar with, okay? Uh, we can do that. I also use food there. Uh, food uh, is a great tool 
when applied at the right time. Okay, but if your dog's in a state of agitation and you feed him, yeah. one, he doesn't want it because he's under stress, or two, you're technically telling him, do that again, right. here's a treat, right? right? Classes eight and nine would be variables that we can use to cover another beha a behavior again that maybe we need to review, uh, or we can press more things sure. obedience-wise, okay? But walk with me, don't pull or heal. Come when I call you, recall, and go there, don't move. Those three things will allow you to do a ton with your dog, yep. okay? If we cannot get um, goose rape, Yep. If Goose, let's say we do all the exercises, you're like, Jesse, you know, he's just not taking the new people. I go, no problem. You have place. So when guests come over, you're like, all right, bud, we don't need to be territorial. Calm down. That's one part. The next part is now go to your bed and don't move for the next right. four hours while we have a guest come over. Okay? So you will be able to have as normal of a life as possible with your dog because you have, on one hand, obedience, but in the other hand, you have the ability or uh, the, the exercises. Manage. Exactly. Because yeah. with nervous guys, it's trust. I don't care if it's the one-off person, like the maintenance guy, that you're gonna see for an hour and then probably not for another two years, okay? But your friends, your family, people that would come over regularly, that's more realistic because he's gonna see them repeatedly, Yeah. okay? So the ceiling is actually much higher. It's usually people limit themselves because they're thinking like, this has already been so difficult so far. Uh, if they have failed, other, uh, if other trainers have failed them, yeah, obviously it's, 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 it's not a great motivator. But uh, I would say in nine, that's what we can accomplish, okay? Uh, if you did 12, it just gives you a bigger buffer, gives us a bigger buffer to cover more things. Uh, behaviorally, if he's doing really well, I help advance your obedience even further, okay? So the only command that needs to be off-leash reliable is recall, come, right? Otherwise, it's pointless. Every other command can also be built to an off-leash level, but it's whether or not you want it, yeah. okay? The more control over you have over your dog, the more freedom you have. Um, 12 week, like for the average person, is like the person that goes hiking with their dog, hunting, to go to restaurants with their dog. Uh, we'd love to do all of that. It's just been just out of reach yeah. because we have zero confidence in our yeah, ability yeah. to do so it. Right? So the longer the program, the more time we have to do that stuff. And typically what happens with these, he's stopping something. He has a stick on his face. <laughs> um, so typically when we do behavior and obedience, okay? Uh, so you're not in the behavior program realm, which is like a, the $5,000 one that you may have seen, okay? I would put you at the regular obedience stuff, but also covers behavior, sure. okay? That other program, uh, just so that you're aware, it's a lifetime program in the sense that I come in, I usually say 12 to 16 classes, I get all the work done, I train the dog to an off-leash level, and I say if anything ever happens, like uh, somebody steps on the dog tail and if they regret what have you, call me up, I come back, I help you bring the dog back to stability, you don't pay more money. Okay, and then I go, thanks for the opportunity, and I go, and if you need something, call me again. Okay? Yeah. Otherwise, with the fat, the flat or fixed programs, if we do 12 and then down in the future, you decide you need want two more for whatever reason, you would just pay the price of two like more. Like hard. Yeah, yeah, okay. I mean, honestly, like, if, if we got through 12 and we were happy and comfortable with where he got to, then we would just do with Birdie and just get her. I know, that was gonna be my other question though. So, I think the other problem I've been having, which, she doesn't have any behavior. She doesn't have, uh, well, I was just going to say in general, the second dog choice was maybe, we love her, but like with dealing with him, it's been a, like, the problem is if I'm only the only one home and I walk into him, she, she does not, she's not healing. She's, she's one year old. She doesn't listen to a single thing I say. There's, uh, she's very, her, her, very she, It's not that she gets into the red zone, but like she loves hunting. I mean, like squirrels and stuff. So she just, you know, won't. It's sort of the prey drive. But it's so. sort of the same concept where it's like, we, we've we struggled to override that with her, even though it's not a really like aggression or fear sure. or nervousness. It's a different, it, different mental To state. break through to her has been but difficult, so like especially for the heel training and mm -hmm. stuff, would you suggest, like, me, when, we, when we work on her goose, like, should we try to walk them step? Like, so what I would suggest, do you like saving money? Yeah. I would do them both at the same time. Okay. Do the heel training at least? Yes. Okay. So you pay for my time, I show up. Okay. I don't charge per dog. Okay. okay? Oh. So what you can do is you buy your program, right? Let's right. say you sure. want 12. 12. Yeah. Right, right. And then you extend, usually I, I recommend the first two classes. Very rarely do we ever need more than that, but it does happen. Is you pay uh, an upcharge, I think it's like 75, 100 bucks or something, to add an additional hour. Okay. So we have an hour for one dog, an hour for the other dog. Okay. Uh, and we do that for the first two classes. Once you get that down, everything else, you could probably just bring him That's and then you do what you did with him yes. with the other dog, okay? okay? The other thing is, let's say we do nine with this guy, right? Yeah. 
and you're like, Jesse, this is amazing. Can we do the other three with our other dog? I go, sure. We've already covered heel because you did that the first two classes. Recall is going to take a class. Place is going to take a class, and that still leaves you with one class left right. over. Okay. So um, the only thing, the variable in play, is, is, is his behavior. I know what I can get done in this period of time. As long as the client shows up and does the homework, I, that's why my programs are, are set the way they are. That's why they're more expensive. Okay. Because I come, I want you. I want to train your dog, and I don't want to hear from you again. Okay. You guys are nice people. That's a, yeah. But that's how I view it. Right. If you get a plumber, right? fix my toilet right. and I don't want to see right. you again, at least not for this problem. Right. Exactly. I think nowadays people are caught up with, it's a dog, that's not realistic because they're animals. And to a degree, yes, like I can't make them unnervous, right? But if you have the right know-how, your dog understands the concept of the collar and everything like that and everything is correct, it should be like, you, unless something out the blue happens, right. then I'll go, yes, call me. Another incident. Exactly, that's, right? Yeah, like shit sure. does happen in the course of years with your dog. Right. But I don't want to hear from you week to week to week after the program, so I'm like, I did something wrong then. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, I think that makes sense to us too because it's like, I think what we've been looking for for a while is also like a system, if that makes sense, yeah. right? That we can continue to use in the long term over, you know, once we're done working with a trainer versus, you know, some trainers will say like, well, they're never fixed and, you know, they kind of sell you on maybe like, yeah, yeah to the degree, yeah. Like the whole two months thing. Yeah. Like, so when I first started training and I still hold this um, today, I showed up. I charge you 25 bucks for the hour. If I didn't get it done within the hour, if I wasn't happy with the progress I didn't charge you, I'd say I'll see you in a week, okay? And that's how I got all my experience. So I paid my dues a long yeah. time ago. Very rarely, if I tell you, okay, this is a three week boarding train, okay? And then for whatever reason, the case was difficult. I said, I need two more weeks, I'm not charging you. Cause I told you, I can get this done in three weeks. Yeah, yeah. I, you know what I'm saying? No, so, yeah. and what, what I meant though is like, learning how to use the tool of the collar, right? And once he's sort of at that stage where he understands it and has learned the thought process of, oh, okay, if I don't react. Yeah, don't exactly. Like that to me makes a lot more sense because it's a tool that, that we can always have and use, right? So mm -hmm. like, we fix the issue, right? We don't need the plumber to come back again, but we've also sort of learned how the toilet works. Exactly. Right, that's, yeah, that's a good way to put it, more, yeah. Much more, I think, beneficial for us. Yeah, right? I mean, because you have to live with this guy the rest of your lives, yeah, exactly. right? I don't. Yeah. I already know how to handle this. So when we get cases like this, I always tell people, like they'll come in wanting a board and train. Board and train is more money and it's easy money. But I go, if we don't see the problem, well then you can't see me fix the problem because we record everything and we send it to you. Totally, yeah. uh, I go, with anything human related, reactivity related, if possible, I always tell people, do it yourself. Because you're gonna learn everything yourself. It's experience for you. I already know how to do this. Uh, so that's not a problem. Uh, but yeah, that's what I would suggest. And uh, you can let Tina know you can mull it over. Okay. It does impact the system that I would recommend for you. Yeah. So the collar that I would recommend for him does not come with the two dog version. Okay. The previous version, it would be one remote, two dogs, and you could always pair a second remote. Okay. They discontinued that model. The current model is only a one dog system. However, we can build a two dog system a la carte, but we have to do it ahead of time. Okay. So if you want your own remote that controls both dogs, and you want your own remote that controls both dogs, you, we have to invoice you for that first, and I have to send it to Dogtra, because they have to do it sure. in-house. Yeah, we yeah. can't do it ourselves. Yeah. If it's one remote to two dogs, we can do it ourselves, no problem, but then what people end up struggling with is, hey, Jesse, I, I have the remote, she's yeah. got the one dog, how do we do this, right. okay? The other option is, you buy one remote for him with the collar, one remote for her with the collar, but now you have two remotes, one for each dog. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's completely up to you. You can do that, no problem for me. But if it's like, yeah, we want the ease of, we both have control over both dogs at both times or at all times, then please let us know because we have to get the system, show Dogtra your invoice that you've paid it. They pair it usually around a two to three week turnaround. So that's what, that's why it's ready for when you uh, start your training. If you get your collar through us and it, for whatever reason is not in, by the time you guys start your program, you decide to move forward, I will provide you with the loaner, okay, for the inconvenience. Yeah. Uh, but doctor's pretty good about getting yeah. a turnaround they're, in a couple weeks. Like yeah, 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 they're the best. I think I have a, a Carmen or whatever. Yeah. That, that he has on pick, but I know a lot of trainers use doctors. Yeah, it's the best uh, in my opinion. I've been using it for 12 years. Uh, I had tried it a couple of other brands, and it's not the same, especially when you're doing with people. Well, yeah, and most of like you said, don't have that range of sensitivity. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, any other questions? No, I think that makes sense because I, I do think, yeah, part of the issue is Gertie also doesn't listen. <laughs> and so trying to like teach him heal with a dog that's not doing anything. Correct. You know, it's no. like, 
I also think it makes it harder on me to control him, which has been another issue because she might be trying to get a squirrel over here and he's reacting to a dog over there. Mm -hmm. And I'm literally like Getting torn apart yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. like I'm like, which one am I trying to focus on right now? So So yep. Okay. Um Tina will reiterate all this stuff to you. Okay. Uh and then the when you know what you want to do and what system you that, that's the most important it's just what system. Yep. Okay. Yep. So that I can right away take it, ship it to Dog Tra, yep. and then you don't have to pay the shipping stuff. I handle all that for you. Um, and then it comes with a one year warranty on uh, so if anything happens, if it happens within a month I can swap out the the like the collar if anything is, is not uh, doing well. Uh, swap it out for you. After thirty days you have to deal with Dog Tra. But we do have collars that we sometimes borrow out to clients yep. because shit happens. Okay. Yep. Uh, otherwise, if there's anything you forgot to ask, please feel free to reach out to Tina. If it pertains to me, she'll email me and I'll get back to you. If you want to make things a little bit more streamlined, uh, you know, say, hey, we want to do nine or we want to do 12, what have you, and we also want to train our second dog, and then she'll just start looking at my calendar. Uh, it's easiest if you provide both of your availabilities up front, because that's exactly what she's going to ask you for. Okay? Yeah. And then she cross-references your calendars with my calendar to see where do we sync up. And then uh, you would get your, your time slot and all that stuff. Okay. okay. Do you typically do work, work the same time slot with your clients? Typically, you yes. Okay. If you have like a rotating schedule, like we get clients that are like in the ER and all that stuff, um, what we ask is uh, give us your schedule ahead of time okay. as best you can, right? And then I might not see you sometimes for a week or so because okay. our schedules just don't line up, yes. okay? It's nothing bad. After we get the first class, it's just more time for you to get stuff done. Right. With the way that I train, people always worry like, oh, like I gotta go on vacation like after my second class. I'm like, don't worry about it. Like the, the way that it's taught and everything, like you're not gonna lose anything. As soon as you come back from the vacation or if you don't see me for a couple weeks, you're already making progress. If anything, it works to your benefit because you get more time to have flare ups, screw ups, make mistakes, the dog screws up. So then when you come back, you have like all this, exactly. And I go, great, we have some homework and then I help you. Sorry, and that, that brought up one more question. So we do have dog walkers that will have to come. Like, obviously they're not going to know. The they don't have to reinforce the training. It okay. won't impact the training. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And he, I, we haven't heard anything about him, honestly. Like, I guess there's been no. a couple blurbs about him maybe getting a little reactive, but like he's never had a big incident when they're walking him. Mm -hmm. And they've never expressed like, hey, this was behavior that like we're really worried about. Sure. So I don't know, maybe doesn't feel well one thing to take into consideration is that you're his family you give him something to protect yeah right that you empower him right uh, so that's not uh, I would say uncommon don't feel bad uh, like it's nothing that I'll no, say I mean, you're doing wrong it's just instinctual it's stuff fine. yeah in fact I, I, it makes me feel a little bit better if he less like, liability I don't there have anything. <laughs> yeah I honestly because I do get worried about it like a lady was uh, one of the walkers was like there was a construction guy outside the house and he did not like that number. Right yeah. He's done that to me. Yeah. You know, so like he hasn't. Uh, but it does scare me. But most but of his walkers, like he usually has the same walkers who know him and are used to him. Sure. So that also probably helps. Him. Last thing uh, is harnesses uh, make reactivity worse, which okay. is why I brought it up earlier. I know this is like a no pull harness with its front clip. No pull harnesses are on oxymorons because harnesses are meant for pulling. For now, don't change what you have. Just keep yeah. doing what you're doing. Uh, but that is something that's just going to get tossed away. I mean, that's again, also great, right? We just have it because, like, we need to control them yeah, right yeah. now. And, and yeah, actually, weirdly enough, he used to pull really bad. And I will say, something about the harness, he does pull. It diverts the pressure. Yeah. yeah. So what happens is when they pull forward, because uh, of the way it's surrounding the front legs, it diverts it, as opposed to if you put that clip on his back, yeah. it's even worse because he's putting his chest into yeah. the uh, oh, yeah. he, into when, the harness. He had, when he was it's up like up, he, he used to like I, we ended up switching but now that he because I couldn't even walk. I couldn't walk the two of them mm -hmm. because they were both pulling, and I was like, I'm not strong enough for this because sure. she's she's a year. She's 50 something. He's 65. So he is a little better with that. The harness does nothing for the puppy. Yeah. She doesn't care. Um, I, if anyone's gonna need a high level, it's gonna be puppy. Uh, last last thing is if you go to my website, canineperspective.com, it doesn't matter how you spell canine, uh, if you go on my homepage and you just kind of scroll up a little bit, uh, you'll see a YouTube video. Uh, I believe it's got a pit bull like smiling in the sun. That is a great video to watch because it was a reactivity case both for its humans and dogs. And within the first class, you see me relax her and I'm even petting her and she's not acting out. And I explain kind of like this. So I have the footage as here's an example and then I have me breaking into it or breaking it down um, as opposed to here's a one hour long lesson and then right. you just gotta pull out the information on your own. Right. That video is also a part of a greater playlist that also has other videos where I break it down 
uh, and I show reactivity cases and I go, this is the theory, this is how it works, blah, blah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it was a pleasure, good. guys. Thank My next so client much. is already here. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Any so questions, you let us know. We'll take Sounds care. Sounds good. All right. Thanks so much. And then Tina will just email all the, like, about.